Welcome to the Think It, Make It podcast. We're all about turning your ideas into reality with a CNC router, tips and tricks, new products, interviews with the pros, and much, much more. Whether you're using a CNC for business or hobby, we have great stuff in store for you. Let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Think and Make It podcast. This is episode 21. My name is Eric. I'm here with Greg and Bobby this week. And uh, this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're actually going to talk about, uh, in the next three episodes, we're going to talk about each one of our projects and how we design them in Vetric. Uh, and as a result of that, it's going to require an online component. So what we're doing as we're recording the audio for this, where we're recording the screen with the audio as well. So when this episode goes live, we'll have a, a video on YouTube to accompany this episode. So if you are listening in the car, we're going to do the best we can to talk and not say things like click this here or point to stuff that you can't see. Um, We'll try. I can't promise 100% that that won't be the case, but just know that if you want to check out this episode, it will be available in video form and you'll be able to see the screen and see exactly what we're talking about. Now, on this episode, I am going to be doing a demonstration of my project because um, I believe we're all ready, but mine is a little bit involved, so it might take up a good portion of the uh, the episode, and then Greg wants to talk about a tip towards the the end of the episode today. Uh, so right now I've got uh, VCarve Pro up on the screen, and uh, we're going to get into it. So what was your project again, Eric? So we're doing, um, designed a, a display case to hold uh, pocket knives. So um, what I wanted to do was, originally I was going to make it out of plywood, but I just couldn't come up with any good way of doing this out of plywood um, without having to edge band the ends of the plywood. And then I, I don't know. I just, I've seen some online that are done with like walnut and oak. And uh, so I, I want to do this one out of a, out of a traditional wood board. So I haven't completely decided whether I'm going to go with pine poplar or per perhaps use like maple or, or oak to do this yet. But it doesn't really matter because I designed this to use nominal size lumber. So if I went and decided I wanted to do it out of oak, I would still buy a one by five board and uh, for the sides of the box. And then I would still use a one by three for the edges of the actual door itself. And just for those who, who may be just joining us, you were doing the, the knife display box, right? Correct. That's why I said, yep. The... So it'll be so. What it'll do? This particular one is going to be 14 inches wide by 30 inches tall, and it'll hold um, 10 different pocket knives. So that's it'll have a um, a hinge door on the front with uh, glass or, or well, I probably won't be glass. It'll probably be acrylic because I wanted to make everything on the CNC for this project. So my plan was to not have to use any traditional tools with the exception of I'll probably need a screw gun to mount or at least a screwdriver to mount the hinges um, and probably a palm sander just to lightly sand, you know, any of the surfaces before I, I stain it. So, and that was the other thing. I didn't want to paint this. Uh, I wanted it to be stained. So you granted, while you could buy, you know, birch or oak or maple plywood and do it that way and still get a good stain finish, I wanted to do it out of traditional lumber that saves me from having to do any edge, edge banding and things like that. So with any job that I do that I'm making a cabinet or something like that in Vetric, keep in mind, Vetric is a, it's a 2d drawing program. So you really don't have the ability to model anything in three dimensions. So what I tend to do is I usually will draw my project in at least two views. So I'll, I'll draw it in a face view, which is what's on our screen now. And sometimes I'll draw like a right side or a top view, depending on what the project is. Now in this particular one, I didn't need to draw 
a left or a side view uh, simply because there, there's not much to see. And, and as I go through this, you'll understand why. So what I did do off to the side of my work area, I drew a bunch of lines and this basically represents the, the cabinet that you would see uh, looking at it from the front. So I'm using a couple different layers here uh, on the screen. And if I go up into my layers panel, uh, you'll see that there's a front profile and a front profile box. So if I hide the, um, the box part, what I'm left with is the outer perimeter of the cabinet, which uh, is 14 and a half by 30 and a half. Um, so I lied. It's 14 by 30 is the cabinet itself. The front door actually overhangs a quarter inch all the way around. So the overall footprint is 14 and a half by 30 and a half. The inside most vector is the window size. So that's, so if you were to look at this and you, you look at it almost like a picture frame. So I'm going to cut outside the outer line and inside the inner line. Uh, if I was cutting this door out of a piece of plywood, then that's exactly what I would do. I would cut outside the outer line, inside the inner line, and I'd end up with a door frame. Um, but because I want to do this out of traditional lumber, and I really couldn't find anything that would, because even a 14 inch wide board is only 13 and a quarter or so inches wide. So I would need to find like a 15 or 16 inch wide board. And now you get very, very expensive. And it's hard to find something that wide that lays down flat then I would have to run it through a planer and go through all of that. So keeping in mind that we only have a $250 budget and I want to design this in such a way that it, it there's profit in it. Um, I decided to use a smaller or by smaller, I mean, not narrower wide, narrower widths of wood. Um, so this door frame that's on the screen represents four pieces of wood that'll be mitered in the corners. And I didn't show the mitering um, on the screen, but basically what we would end up having here is uh, if I put a line here, I can show that th there would just simply be a, a miter just like this in each corner. And so I would have two sides that are exactly the same and I would have a top and bottom that are also exactly the same. So that's, that's how I uh, designed this. Now, the third line here, the one that's in the middle, basically what that is, is that is the recess pocket where the glass or the plexiglass will fit into the door from the backside. So when I cut these strips of wood, I'm cutting them face down. So I'm actually cutting the backside. So I will, that way I don't have to do a two-sided job. I'll cut the, the pocket out here which represents where the glass is going to go. And then I will cut the perimeter of each one, including the 45s. And then I'll end up with, uh, so it's, it's really only two files too, because the top is symmetrical with the bottom and the left and right are symmetrical. So I just need to uh, run two separate files and I can cut the entire thing. So why, why do the miter? Why not just cut a, a rectangle? Because if I cut a rectangle, I would have to have a piece of lumber that I'm starting out with, it's 14 and a half inches wide by 30 inches long. And then, and, and so if I could find a piece that was 14 and a half inches wide, like if I go to a lumber center, like Hinneman or somebody like that, I know I can find a piece of lumber that's that wide. Most likely it'll be rough cut. So then I've got to plane it, right? Whether I run it through a planer, actually I can't run it through a planer because our planer is only 12 inches wide. So I mm -hmm. wouldn't be able to fit this. So I would have to put this on the machine, then run a surfacing bit on it to get it plain and flip it over. Not, not only that, once I cut this, if I were to cut this out of one board, everything inside the innermost line, which is where the window would be, is essentially scrap. So I'm not using it, right? There's also more chance when you're doing something like this that if I were to cut out the center and cut out the, the top, that the entire thing will twist more. So by cutting these into four pieces and then gluing them up, and, and, and clamping it down to a table, I can ensure that it's going to be stable and it's not going to twist. As soon as you start cutting out big areas of a board, you start relieving tension on it. And over time, there's a possibility it'll cup or it'll twist or 
it'll check, something will happen to it, and it'll cause it. Now, if I was doing this out of plywood, no problem. Uh, then I, I don't care so much about the waste because plywood's cheaper. Uh, and then I could probably use that inside piece for like some small project down the road. Uh, it would be a good, you know, scrap use. But if I did this out of plywood, I would have exposed plywood edges all the way around the outside. So I would have to edge band it. And then once I edge banded, I'd have to sand the edges. And if I wanted to put a profile around the outside, like rounding it, or you can't do that with edge banding. So you can edge band a square edge. And then as soon as you run a round over bit on it, you'll start to re-expose the plies in the plywood and it, it won't look good. If I was painting it, I could probably seal the edges with joint compound or something, sand it, and I can get it so it looks decent. But I do want to put some sort of a profile, even if it's just a small round over on the outside edge, just so it's not sharp. It looks better, you know, more finished. So I can't do this with plywood. And then I would have to edge band the inside. And that gets a little tricky because if I'm using three quarter plywood, my edge banding is slightly wider than three quarters of an inch. And then I have a tool that you use. It's like two razor blades and you run it along the edge of the wood and it cuts the excess edge banding from the top and the bottom. Well, if I do this dado pocket um, or rabbit, I should say on the inside uh, for the, to relieve the space for the plexiglass, then I'm no longer three quarters of an inch thick. So now I'm, I'm trying to put edge banding in an area that's, that's less than three quarter. And I don't really have an easy way to trim it. And I, I think it'll look, I don't think it'll look good. So do, doing it out of four pieces of wood, gluing it up, that that's going to give me the best result. Um, so the other layer that I have here is the front profile box. And I probably should have chose a different color. Um, and actually this one, I didn't do the miter on that. So, um, delete this, the delete key on this computer. Okay. So what this represents is the actual box that sits behind the door that mounts on the wall. And in this case here, it's the same basic principle. I have uh, a top and a bottom. And then I have two sides and again, they're symmetrical. So the only difference is these boards are going to be four inches deep, I guess, which is the dimension you can't see from this view. So you're looking at this box from the top. You have to imagine that if I laid this on the table, it would be four inches up, right? So this miter that's in the corners on this are actually mitered. Um, they're not mitered the same way as the front door. They're mitered at a 45 along the width. So it would be normally something you would use like a chop saw for, or I guess you could use a table saw to do it. Um, not something that you, you commonly would do on a CNC machine because when I cut these box pieces, I'm laying the boards flat. So that means I have to cut a 45 degree while the board is laying flat. And there's a really cool way to do that in Vetric, and I'm gonna explain that in a minute. So what you're looking at here, I did put the 45 so you can see there's there's two boards, the top, bottom, left, right. And then the, again, there's this inside recess here. And what that recess represents is a rabbit that's in the back side of the box to accept the back of the box, right? So when you look at the front, you won't see that. When you look at it from, from the top view, you will not see that. But if you flip the box upside down, you'll see a rabbit that goes all the way around it's roughly a quarter of an inch in, and then I will cut the back panel on the machine and glue it inside. So it's so when so now the whole back is completely flush, right? So that's what that represents. So I, I wanted to get all of the geometry into this profile view, so I have an idea what this thing's going to look like from the front, and I use layers to separate the door from the uh, box itself, just so I can kind of keep in mind what's what. And, you know, what, what is this going to look like and how is, how is it going to be represented, um, you know, as I start cutting it. Now, as I mentioned in an earlier podcast, I want to be able to cut all of these pieces on the CNC machine. And I could cut everything here using traditional clamping methods. I guess I could take um, a one by four 
Uh, well, this the side pieces are two inches wide, so I could use a one by three piece of whatever oak, maple, poplar, it doesn't matter. And I could use double side tape to hold it down to the spoil board on the machine. I could use blue painters tape and CA glue. Um, I could use uh, plastic brad nails. Um, I could even use clamps. Right now, the problem with clamps is if I if I were to clamp these pieces down, I would have to put tabs somewhere so that when the piece finally comes free, it doesn't just fall off the table and, and move. So double side tape would probably be my, if I didn't have a vacuum solution, double side tape would be the way I would do this. Uh, from a production standpoint, if I was making only one double side tape makes a lot of sense, right? I, I could just grab a, a one by three piece of wood, right? Um, and I could just put it on the machine with some double side tape and then just simply cut out my parts. It's not, not a big deal. And then I could just peel them off the table and, and I'll be fine. Um, I don't like that idea if you're going to do this in production. And since part of this challenge is that we're going to design something we're going to sell that hopefully you sell a lot of, which means you have to make a lot of them. So I'm trying to think of ways to make the production of these repeatable but painless. And while double-sided tape is not completely a pain, it's still another thing. It's another step, something else you have to buy. You got to peel the tape off. You got to clean. It's just, yeah, it's a pain. Um, I don't yeah. like it. Those rolls, they're not cheap. They, they can get up there with some decent double-sided tape. Yeah, I mean, the, the stuff we use uh, is, what, $14 a roll or something. It's not. Yeah, go through that quicker than you think. Yeah, especially with something, because you think about it, this is 30 inches long, right? So these side pieces, that's 60 inches. So there's five feet and it's 14 inches wide. So let's just say six, seven. So it's eight feet of tape just to make the four pieces for the uh, door frame. And then you got another eight feet to hold down the material to make the box. Then I'm going to use more tape to make the back panel. And then I got to make the acrylic, which is more tape. So, you know, you're probably going to use 30, 35 feet of tape to hold this down. So, um, yeah. So I decided that I'm going to not do that way and I'm going to make, um, make a vacuum fixture. So first thing I did was I designed a fixture, which is right here. And I, I, so I made my work area the same 14 and a half by 30 and a half, uh, that the outside is. And I just did that out of habit because when I set up the job on something like this, I center everything. So my fixture is centered here on, on this. Uh, I made the fixture the 30 and a half inches long. So really all I had to do when I select a fixture, if I center it, everything's centered on that job. Now, eventually, right now, I've got this set to the lower left corner as a datum. Um, it's okay to do that for, for this purpose, but I will probably change that when I start to cut these to the center. Since I centered everything on the job, it makes sense to have your datum be the center. So if I like the um, the vacuum fixture, I'm probably going to use uh, either PVC or MDF, I guess, for the for the vacuum fixture itself. Uh, PVC is a little bit better because it's more airtight. Uh, MDF will leak air. That's why we use it for spoil boards. However, the volume of air that I'll have cruising through that. Uh, holding the material down will supersede any leakage that I'm getting. So MDF would probably work. And I guess if I really wanted to, I can, you know, spray shellac or something on the MDF after it's been cut. Um, but honestly, I hate working with MDF because it makes a mess and dust is everywhere. So I'll probably cut this vacuum fixture out of PVC. So just to explain what we're looking at here, I've got my vacuum fixture board, which I set to um, eight inches by 32 inches. So eight inches wide, 32 inches long. And then I have a grid that's on here and that grid represents the, um, channels where the vacuum is going to flow. I also have a secondary grid on there, the, the grid that goes all the way around the perimeter. And there's one piece that goes across the center. Um, actually it's not the center. It's a little further down. Um, I'll show you in a second, but what that represents is where I'll put the cord for the sideboards. All right. So when I'm cutting the, um, 
the left and right sideboards of the box, they're going to sit flat on this fixture, right? So if let's just say I'm cutting this, this long sideboard, the left and right side, then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to put a vacuum cord all the way around the channel here. And I'm going to lay that board on top. I don't really care if it's straight or not. I just want to make sure that the board is on there so that when the end mill runs all the way around the perimeter, that it cuts the material. So I don't want to have it so crooked that I, I end up not cutting the material because the point of this is that I would get material that's just a little wider than what I need. So I can make a machined cut all the way around the edge. I'm not using the factory cut on any of this. So I control the cut around the perimeter. I control the 45s. I want to control everything when I do this. So that's kind of how I have it. Now, I did say, you know, it doesn't matter if the grain is straight. It, I mean, if the board's straight, it does because of the grain. You want to make sure that, you know, you don't want to have it be crooked because if you're going to stain this, you're going to see the grain. So you don't want to look at the side of the cabinet and have the grain be running off at 30 degrees or something. It would look, it would look silly. But when I say it doesn't have to be perfectly straight, I mean, you don't have to sit there and use calipers to measure it. You could, if you're off a 16th of an inch or something, it's going to be fine. Um, so what I have here in the fixture is I have a circle right in the center. This is the exact center of the job and the exact center of the fixture. That will be a one, it's a one inch circle and that'll be my pocket. So that's going to go down and that's where I would align this because I'm not going to set up the CNC machine to run this knife case, right? And leave it there forever and ever and ever. I'm going to cut one for a prototype and then I'm going to take this off the machine and use the machine for other things. So I need this fixture to be able to easily go on and off the machine and when I do put it on the machine, I have to have a place to identify where the center of the fixture is. So I would use my 3D touch probe, put it in the center of that hole. I would probe the center. And now I know the exact center of where the job is. So everything I run from that point forward is based on the exact center of the fixture. So if I design everything to be cut based on the exact center, then, I'm, then I, I, everything will always line up always. Um, so that's what that pocket represents. Now you could say, well, okay, well, what guarantees that the fixture is straight on the machine and what guarantees that it's not going to move? So I made the fixture as a two sided job. So if I click over to see the bottom, I have four holes here that are four circles. And what these circles represent are the exact center of the vacuum table squares on the machine. So everybody's machine might, will be slightly different, but on our particular machine, these circles will represent, so from the center of this circle, to the center of this circle, they will be in the center of the squares on the machine. So, and the same thing on these two, on the two upper ones. So what I'll do there is I'll use, I'll figure out, okay, here's where I want to put the fixture on the machine. I have a circle right here, another circle on the bottom. See, here I said, I said right here. I apologize for anybody listening to this that's not watching this. Um, I have a circle on the bottom, and that's my vacuum inlet. And that vacuum inlet, I get, I'm going to want to be uh, right above the vacuum inlet on the vacuum table itself, right? So when I cut this, I'll, I'll want to put it on the machine, and I'll determine which squares I want to use. So I'll identify one square on the vacuum table, I'll use the 3D touch probe and again, and I'll probe the outside of that square. That's going to give me a center point above that square. Then I'm going to go ahead and run a, a quarter inch drill bit and I'm going to run this tool path and it's going to cut four circles. But because I already have the spacing from one square to the next, then as soon as I probe one square, then I automatically know that's my X, Y datum, right? And now I'm going to go and I'm going to pop the, the four holes in and they're going to be exactly in the center of those squares. So that takes care of the machine table. So that ensures that I have four holes that I could put dowel pins in that will align this fixture to the machine itself. So now that's probably step one. That's the first thing I would do. The second thing I would do is take a piece of PVC and I would put it on the machine and I would hold that PVC down using vacuum. 
I would put it in roughly the same position of where I just made those four holes. And I would go ahead and I would run that tool path one more time. And I would go ahead and put four holes in the bottom of the PVC sheet. So now I have four holes in the center of the vacuum um, squares on the table. And then I have four holes that match on the back side of the PVC. So when I put dowel pins in, this PVC panel is going to sit perfectly on the machine every time. So when I take it off, put it back on, I use those same holes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, squares on the vacuum table. So for me to say, to sacrifice four centers, it doesn't affect the vacuum. It doesn't affect the rigidity of the table. All I'm doing is putting a square hole, um, a quarter inch hole in the middle of a half inch square. Um, the machine out there now has a bunch of them already on it for other fixtures. All right. So that's how this is going to align itself. So if I wanted to build another one of these down the road, I put my four doll pins in, grab this fixture, pop it on the table. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the cord on the vacuum table itself and make sure that it is on the inside of this, uh, this fixture, right? Like I don't want the cord two inches to the outside. I want to contain the vacuum underneath this panel, this fixture panel. So I'll just reroute the cord. So now when the vacuum is turned on, all of the vacuum is forced through this hole on the bottom of the fixture. And that's transferred via cord in the fixture to hold down the boards that are on top of it. So it'll be like one big sandwich, right? Once I put a board on the top of this, it's going to suck down, which is going to suck the whole fixture down to the machine. And everything is going to going to be nice and flat and held in place. Now, are you concerned that your, your vacuum inlet on the bottom, um, are you going to lose any suction towards the top? Because normally we, we try to center that vacuum um, where the inlet is. Is, is there going to be any concern there? Um, no, because, well, no. And I've got, I, I have one more thing I was going to do that I didn't draw on this yet. So to answer your question, no. And once I put a cord on here, the, the surface area inside this actual fixture itself is not that big. So it doesn't really matter where I have this vacuum port. As long as I have it can quarantined off with a cord, um, it's going to draw just as much vacuum no, no matter where it is. I mean, you're, you're talking about an area that's, uh, what is it, four inches by 30 inches. So it's, it's not going to take much to, um, to pull vacuum on that area and draw it down. However, that being said, um, what my plan was is once this is laid out on the table, if this bottom vacuum port is over the front panel, then that means the vacuum port for the middle panel will be somewhere up here. Hmm. So I will probably bore another hole through this vacuum fixture so that it aligns up with two. the middle. And then I'll use two. And then so when I'm cutting shorter boards, I just turn that valve off on the machine. When I'm cutting longer boards, I turn it on. So now I have the ability to draw vacuum from two ports instead of just one on the machine. So that was my thought. I just didn't draw it yet because I didn't have a dimension uh, between the two. Um, I can go and use a tape measure and measure it, but I, I just figured that's something that's easy enough to put in later. So to simulate what this is going to look like on the fixture, uh, let's go to simulate mode. So I'm using, well, it's got like wood as a texture here, but uh, uh, let's see. That's weird to simulate on this one. I don't see the pass. Uh, you got to be kidding me, Windows. Um, so what we're going to do is let's, let's just do, I'm going to highlight the fixture. And then I'm just going to preview that. I'll just do preview visible. So there's my fixture. All right. So I'll get rid of the axis. Let's rotate this so you can kind of see it. And then I'll zoom in and explain. So the channel all the way around the outside is um, for the cord when you're cutting the side panels because the side panels are going to be four inches wide. So that's where you'll put the cord and then you'll put the wood over it and then it'll cut the perimeter. When it cuts the entire perimeter of the side panels, it will not break vacuum because the cord is slightly inward of the outside profile of the side panels. The sec So when I'm running a full side panel, I just put the, the uh, piece of wood over the entire fixture 
and I run the cord all the way around the perimeter of the fixture and, and it's fine. When I switch to doing the top and bottom panels that are shorter, I'll reroute the cord so it stops halfway, right? That's what this channel here is for. So now I've got a cord only on this smaller half and then I lay a shorter board or I can put a longer board, but I know that I'm gonna have a cutoff there. So I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna, the end mills when it does its final cut is gonna come all the way around. And when it comes over here, it's gonna go and cut through. Now understanding that this fixture is also going to be sort of a spoil board. My cut, if my material is three quarters of an inch, I'm gonna cut probably three or four thousandths into this fixture. So I know when I run an end mill across here, it's gonna cut into these four squares or five squares right here. That's not gonna affect anything because they're still inside of the corded area. So you're never gonna lose vacuum from it. And I wanna make sure that when I cut this, that I end up with um, a clean cut on the top and bottom. So I don't, I have to cut a few thousands below the bottom surface of the material. Sure, the outside won't matter because there's no cords, there's nothing there. Correct. It's over that, but the inside's gonna, the inside cut when you cut it in half is gonna be the only one that matters. Correct. Now, I also designed this fixture so that when I run the uh, door frame pieces, right, those are only two inches wide, but I can use the same fixture because the distance between the um, channel, uh, I want to say one to the second channel in on either side, if I run a cord in those channels, that's a little less than two inches. So now I could put a board on there. I could just reroute the cord inward more and put the board on it. And when I hit um, the vacuum, it's going to suck that board down and hold it in place. And then I'll do the same thing. When I cut the perimeter of those door panels, I'm going to cut slightly outside that board. It will cut into these squares a little bit, but it won't affect anything because the only thing these squares are going to be used for outside of that is when I put the cord on the outside to do the side panels. So I can use this fixture to also be a spoil board and I can use the same fixture for all the pieces I need to cut on this job. So to save yourself a little bit of machining time, uh, you're only going to do this once, so I don't think it's a big deal, but could you remove those squares on the inside? Because normally you have them there to reroute cord should you need it. But since this is a one purpose fixture, could you just get rid of those entirely? Um, no, because you still have to have room for the vacuum. To move, right? You have to have air movement inside the cord. What about a pocket? What if just a, a straight pocket inside there? Yeah, I could do a straight pocket. I've always liked to do squares because it supports the material, right? So when when this board sits on top of the fixture, each one of these squares supports the material, but still lets air travel. Whereas a pocket between, might might have might some sag. flex down. It might draw okay. it in. And I so I, I always like to support things with pockets. And these channels are 5 16 wide. They're plenty wide enough. You're going to have tons of air movement through there. That's not an issue. Uh, there's a lot of guys online that will argue that, you know, you, you got to have a bigger channel and things like that. Keep in mind, wh what you're not doing here, you're not putting pressure downward on the piece to hold it down. Okay, that's not what vacuum's all about. And you're not holding it down by sucking it down. What you're doing is you're removing all of the air or as much of the air as possible to let gravity push this part down. So when you remove using vacuum, when you remove the air under a part, gravity is pushing down on the part and that is what's giving you your hold. So as long as I have, I have to have air movement, it doesn't need to be a huge channel if I had these these channels uh, that were, say, maybe, um, I don't know, half a millimeter thick, right? They were really, really small. It's still going to hold down. It may take a few more seconds to suck all the va uh, the air out to establish a vacuum, but it's still going to work. I just, I'm using the same tool. I want to avoid tool changes. So uh, as long as I have squares to support the material, that channel is plenty wide enough to remove the air. And, and I'm still going to end up with plenty of vacuum. What would their argument be for having a larger channel, just out of curiosity? Well, a lot of people think if you have a larger channel, you've got more airflow, you're going to have more vacuum suction. Now, in this case, it doesn't matter because I'm removing the air from under the board to allow um, gravity. 
and, and a lack of, um, or a draw of vacuum, a lack of air underneath the part to hold it down, okay? Where it would matter, and you would want larger channels for air movement, is if I was going to make this vacuum grid, and then I was going to put a piece of MDF on top and use the MDF as a flow-through spoil board like we do on, on the 4x8 machine, then you want to have more air movement. Because now you're, you're not creating a perfect vacuum, you're drawing vacuum or drawing air movement through the MDF, and then whatever you put on top of the MDF, you're, you want to stick. And in order to do that, you have to have a lot high flow um, air movement in that. So in this case, I'm, I'm sucking a part down and I don't want it to move. So I'm not so concerned about that. If I was gonna put a spoil board on here and then put a board on top of it, works. And the reason I did that is because I was unsure of how I was going to hold down the back panel and the acrylic. So I may use this with a spoil board to do the back panel and the acrylic, or I may just um, put the back panel and the acrylic right over this, hold it down from the center, and then go ahead and cut my perimeter on it. And then the outside of this um, fixture would be a spoil board essentially because my bit would go into it. So I have the ability. And, and again, the idea was I wanted to make sure I can cut every part I need for this out of one fixture. And I, that way I could just pop it on the machine anytime I want zero, pick up my X, Y, zero in the center, and then just go ahead and put my boards on and run those files. Right. The only other thing you need to do is once you pick up X, Y, zero in the center, I will probably establish my Z0 for all of the boards that I cut, no matter which parts they are, and for the acrylic in the back as the um, material bed or spoil board top. So instead of going material top, I would set my XYZ to be the surface of this fixture. Uh, that way it doesn't matter what thickness material I'm using. My Z0 is always the surface of the fixture. And then all I'm doing is just telling Vetric how thick my material is after, and it's going to cut it. So that that's my plan um, for how I want to do this. Now, let's just say I bought, so I decided somebody wanted one of these and they wanted black walnut. And I can't get three quarter inch black walnut, but I need three quarter inch, right? I could use this same fixture, put the black walnut on it, put a surfacing bit on use it. And now I can plane the walnut down, flip it over and plane it again. So I have, I don't have rough cut material anymore, but because I'm using um, a three eighths inch cord, the cord is so big that even if I put rough cut lumber on here, the amount of stick out I have above the surface of the fixture is going to grab even rough cut lumber and hold it down while I do a surfacing tool path. So I have all this, I thought of all this stuff in advance depending on how I want to make these in the future, depending on the type of wood I want to use, whether I'm using rough cut lumber or store-bought lumber from like Home Depot that's already plain. Um, you know, I, I, I thought ahead and I, I built everything into this vacuum fixture. And then again, making it so that it has dowel pins that match on the machine. I could pull it off and on anytime I want, pick up my XY0 in the center, Z0 off the surface of the, of the fixture, and I'm good to go. I could start production. So imagine that you're a shop that you're making a bunch of different things like this, right? On your wall, you could have like uh, fixtures hung constantly. Maybe you have a sticker on the back that tells you what tools you used or what job number or whatever. Um, you know, sometimes I, I'll color coat the grids on the machine. So I'll take a marker and I'll, 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 I'll uh, highlight the top surface of it. That way I know, okay, when I put this fixture on, these are the four I'm using. I mean, it's easy enough to figure out with a tape measure, but, you know, just to make it quicker. So this is what kind of excited me about this project that I'm doing because it allows me to use vacuum work holding to think about productivity. So I'm not just thinking about making one. I'm thinking about making a hundred or a thousand of these things. And how do I make it repeatable? You know, if I, if I was running a shop and I had a person that was running my CNC machine and I went through this trouble. Yes, it's a little bit of trouble. It's a little extra work. Certainly took me probably an hour to figure all this stuff out. But now all I have to do is tell that operator, grab fixture one, two, three, four, put it on the machine and I could give him the files with the tool sets. He could set up the ATC and just put the material on and just start cutting. Right. And 
the files, it, it'll be exactly the same pieces every single time he makes it. So that's what I did there. Um, now that explains my fixture. Uh, I will go into more detail on the fixture when I actually start doing videos where we're cutting things. Yeah. That, I mean, the fixture alone is, is a CNC it's a full there. tutorial, yeah. That's absolutely fantastic, and that's a huge upfront investment, I would say. I'm, I'm curious to, if you, all the materials, and if we're talking time as well, which we said we may not consider, but we may just, just kind of keep track of it to see. I'm, I'm curious where you would be at after getting just that fixture. Well, if I have the time, it would be interesting to make one of these using double side tape and then make one using the fixture and see what the time difference is. Um, if I use PVC, I mean, scrap PVC that we have lying around, but even if you had to buy a full sheet, it's not super expensive. You can go to Lowe's or Home Depot and buy a three quarter inch four by eight sheet of Aztec or something for like 80 bucks. And then you can make a ton of fixtures from it. So, um, if you were doing a, a job shop and you were making this project for somebody, like if somebody came to me and said, Hey, I want you to be my production shop for making these knife cases they would be paying me to make this fixture and they'd be paying for the, for the material and the time and everything it took to make this, even though they're paying me to produce each one of these knife cases for them, the, the price to make this fixture would be added into that first one, that first prototype, right? If, if you go to a, a machining shop that does metal milling, um, you know, they, they're doing the same thing. When they make parts, they have fixtures. You're paying for that fixture. It's not a freebie. Um, they just add it into that first price. Or if you give them a guaranteed run of say 25 pieces, they're going to take that fixture and setup cost and, and divide it out evenly into each of those pieces. So the fixture saves the production shop time. But if you're, you're sourcing somebody to do this for you, you're going to expect to pay for that. Uh, you know, it's just the way it works. Now, what I did here was I left the fixture, but I created a layer for the uh, sideboards. So this is the sideboards of the um, of the box itself. And you can see I, I colored it in blue. So when you look at this video, you can see the, the sideboards are laid out. And I have a pocket or a rectangle that's drawn on the left side. And that represents the um, recess that has to go in this board to hold the back panel on. All right. So let me, um, let me show you, I'm going to turn off the, I'm going to turn off the fixture just so you can see just the sideboard. All right. And then we're going to go and look at the uh, tool paths here. So I've got all my tool paths are grouped and in groups. So I have a sideboards tool path and I have um, three different things here. I have a chamfer, I have a sideboard back panel pocket, which is this rectangle that we're going to mill out so that I can put the back panel in later and it fits nice and flush. I'll glue that in. And then I have a profile side cut. Um, so what we're going to do here, let me um, select them all and go to preview. And then I'm going to preview. I'm going to reset the preview and then preview all visible tool paths. So now if you look here, and again, for those driving, I'm sorry, but what you see now is here's my finished panel, my side panel, right? So it's four feet by 30. It's got a 45 uh, cut in to the ends on either end. It's a perfect 45, just like you would use a chop saw or miter saw for. And how'd you do that? How'd you get that 45 there? Yeah, I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, and then here is, I have a dado, um, I'm sorry, a rabbit on the back side that's uh, cut in, and that's going to accept the, um, the back panel. Uh, so that, that's cut. Uh, now, again, keep in mind, you're looking at this. This is the, the vertical wall, right? So this is four inches tall. So the back panel plywood is going to be half inch thick. Now, the back panel is the only panel I am going to use plywood on because I don't need to use hardwood for that. I just need to make sure that my back panel matches the, the type of wood that I use. So if I use poplar, I have to use poplar plywood. If I use oak, I have to use oak plywood. Um, if I decided that I wanted to use hardwood for the back, most likely I would have to do a glue up. So I would have to take three or four boards, uh, use a traditional jointer planer and, you know, joint the ends 
uh, put them on clamps, glue them up. So I have one wide board and then I can machine that. But in this case, you won't see the plywood grain because it's going to be recessed in the back, right? So you won't see that at all. That's what the whole point of this pocket is, is, you know, when you flip this over, the panel just going to slide in. So the only thing that you're going to see is the front face of the plywood and the grain that it has. You won't even see the back because the back is against the wall, right? So you're only going to see that front face. So to make that easy, it's easy to use plywood for that. But that's the, so this is the side piece. Um, I know you asked me about the, the chamfer, how I did that. I'll show you in a minute. Um, the top and bottom boards are right here. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn off the side and turn on the top and bottom layers. Right. So you can see now that it's it's smaller, right? So this is a smaller panel. Now if I turn the fixture back on, you'll see see how it, it, it only goes. So I've got the cord now shortened. I've got the cord on on less here. I'm still picking up vacuum from this port. If I have a vacuum hole on the top part, I'll just shut off that that uh, valve. Or so you I, could do two two at once. I, yeah, no, I don't want to do two at once. You, yes, you could. I could figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. You could do two at once. Um, and that would mean just cording off the top. I was just thinking about the 45 and that that might cause a problem, but I can, I would just reprogram that to do that. So on this one here, if we're looking at the top and bottom boards, uh, go back to preview, reset the preview, preview visible, get rid of the waste. So now I have a short board. So I have the same 45s. I have the same recess for my back panel. Everything's the same. It's just shorter. Okay. So now, how did I do the 45s? That's the cool part. Um, let me, let's see. I've got the top and bottom shown. So we'll just, we'll just stick with that. Um, Vetric has a gadget called a chamfer gadget. And it, that's basically what that's used for. So, the only problem with the chamfer gadget is you can only calculate it once. So you can't recalculate it. Uh, it doesn't let you make any changes to it uh, easily. So what I'll show you, what you do with the, the chamfer is you have your outside rectangle that represents the profile of the finished part, right? So this is exactly the size I need. Then you have to draw a separate vector at the top. It's really hard to see here, but there's a line that goes across the top. And then I have another one down here that goes across the bottom, okay? So what I'm doing is I wanna select that vector and I wanna select the vector at the top. And then I go into uh, gadgets and I can't show you because I never installed the gadget on this machine. Boy, that's a bummer. Um, <laughs> the, huh, I didn't think that far ahead. Um, uh, with all your fixtures and all your, your thinking. Well, let me, I'll try real quick now. See, it's asking me for the file and I don't have it. Um, yeah, I went through all that trouble. Okay, so not to make this a, a, an issue here. Um, this is essentially what the, uh, the chamfer gadget looks like, except it pops up in the center. So it's asking you your start depth zero, which is the top of the material. It's asking you your cut depth. Now, the gadget will ask you how thick your material is. And in this case, I put in 0.75. But in order for it to get a perfect 45 that goes all the way down to the bottom of the material, it calculates in how much deeper it needs to go. So that's where this 0.786 number is here. The gadget is saying, okay, you want me to cut a, width, a thickness of 0.75. I need to go down... 0.786 in order to get all the way through the material. It's going to ask you to choose a tool. The tool of choice is a ball nose. I'm using a quarter inch ball nose on this. Um, Does it have to be a ball nose? Yes. You you could do it with a, uh, a traditional square end mill, but you'll see steps. And in order to get this, so literally when you're done with this and you, um, you take it off the, it, you'll think you did it with a miter saw. Like it, there's no difference. The, the fit will be perfect. Um, in fact, in my opinion, it's even better than using a miter saw because it's done on a CNC. It is perfect to a couple thousandths where, you know, unless you're a master woodworker, uh, you know, you're lining a, a saw blade up against a pencil mark. You have the ability to move a little bit. So each one of these pieces will be exactly the same. And 
what happens here when you do the um, the preview on this, if I reset the preview and I just select the chamfer itself, you can see it's got tool paths that are created here. And the tool path is going back and forth line by line and it's stepping down each time as it's moving. And then it'll come over and it'll do the same thing on the other side. All right, so if I were to preview just that, um, you'll see it, you know, it, it's, that's exactly what it's doing. It starts at the top, goes back and forth, and it just keeps cutting until it gets all the way through the bottom. So if you look, you could see how there's a slot on the bottom. That's because the ball nose went all the way through the bottom. If it didn't go all the way through the bottom, you, you keep in mind a ball nose is a straight end mill with a radius tip, right? So in order for the edge of that ball nose to make it all the way down so that you're, you have a perfect 45 all the way through to the bottom of this board, it has to go deeper just because of the profile of the ball nose itself. So that's why it's calculating that. Did you take that into account on the bottom section? So the middle section, it's okay to, to get because there's nothing, there's no seals there. But on the bottom section of your fixture, when the ball nose goes through, did you take that into account? Yeah, because the seal for the it's still on uh, the it's, inside. It's on the inside, right? That the the bottom edge. So let let's just do um, let me do the profile cut here, right? And let's pro let's preview that. So this this doesn't have the rabbit in it for the back, but it's previewed. So this bottom edge from this bottom edge to this bottom edge here, the, the entire length is, is the size that I, that represents my, uh, my profile vector for that. So I wanted these to be, I believe they're 14 and a half inches, right? So if I click on this, it's uh, 14 inches. So it, it, so my final piece will be exactly four inches wide by four, 14 inches tall. And that takes into consideration the uh, bevel that's put on the 45, right? So that's, that's a chamfer gadget. I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it installed on this computer, but I will show it again when I do the cutout for this because I'll have to recalculate it. Uh, so that's that's basically how that works. Can you do a quick time estimate on that chamfer with the ball um, nose? Because I know usually when you use a ball nose, you're, you're adding a ton of machining time because yeah, it's sure. such, so, it's so very fine. That too. So on this one, and I didn't optimize this, so I, I just used standard. Um, let's see what we got here. Chan for two minutes. Two minutes? Oh, that's it? Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's a lot faster than I thought it would be. Yeah. So it's not, it's not, in fact, um, the top and bottom board back pocket, that's three minutes. So to do that rabbit is three minutes. Now, the reason is because I had programmed it with an eighth inch end mill because that's what I had in there. Now, obviously, one of the steps I'll take before I go ahead and I run this job is I'll optimize it. So I, I did, you know, on that rabbit, I would probably use a quarter inch or a three eighths end mill and it would go down to like 20 seconds. Now we um, know these times aren't perfect. Uh, the estimates are never perfect with Vetric. Sometimes they can be really far off depending on your feed rate that you enter there, but they're good for comparison. So comparing to other tool paths, that sort of thing. Correct. Yeah. Like I, I would, I would have to recalculate this, but yeah, it's going to be, you know, this is saying it's seven minutes and fifty-five seconds to do this one panel. Um, no, it'll be it'll be a lot less than that. My guess is it'll be about three minutes, three and a half minutes a piece. Now, you might be able to argue if you're like a, a woodworker and you have all these machines in your shop, you can argue. Okay, wait a second though, I could put this on um, on my table saw and I can rip the sides of this. I could put it on the chop saw and do the forty-fives, and then I could put it on um, a router table and and do the rabbit and i could probably do that in the same time or less less time and yes you're absolutely right i mean a, 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 a traditional cabinet maker could make this thing a lot faster than i can on the cnc no doubt but i don't have those tools right so if you only have a cnc machine you can you can get your miters you can get your rabbit you can get your um anything that you would do on traditional tools i can cut the perimeter which is what i would use a table saw for i can even surface it which is what i would use a planer for you know if if i wanted to make say i had four of these panels that i wanted to glue together end to end to make a wide board normally you would use a jointer for that which is another machine well if i was cutting those 
left and right edges on the CNC, I don't need a jointer because I already have perfectly machined edges. So if I took four panels and I laid them together with glue, they're going to fit perfectly tight to one another. So all of the traditional woodworking machines that you would normally use to make something like this, it might even be faster to do it on traditional machines. If you have all these machines in your shop and they're all set up and you're doing production, yeah, I mean, you can run off a bunch of them at one time. It would, it would be faster, but the, the purpose of this exercise is I, I don't have all those machines, so I only have my CNC. How can I get my CNC machine to do everything that you would find in a traditional woodworking shop? Well, and the fact that once you put this down on the machine, you let the machine run and you're freed up to do something else while it's cutting. Correct. And, and it's infinitely repeatable. I, I don't have to worry about uh, resetting up stops or anything like that. Once this is done, the program's the program, right? So if you set up all of your traditional machines, your table saw, your chop saw, your planer, your router table, you set all those things up to make these ca these cabinets. And then after you're done making cabinets, you go and you reset all those tools up to do something else. You have to reset them all up again perfectly before you can run another set of these cabinets. So there is some setup time there. Now with me, I'm gonna create one fixture. I'm gonna create a few programs and that's it. The next time I want to run this, I put the fixture on the machine, I drop my board on the top, I run the program, and it comes out perfect. I don't have to reset up anything. Everything is based on that zero, zero center from my fixture and my Z0 on the, ter on the surface of the fixture. So, you know, it's, it's the CNC, you know, you're going to talk. I mean, uh, you know, traditional woodworking guys, a lot of, a lot of them don't like CNC machines. Uh, they, they think it's, you know, it, it, it lessens the... I don't know the craft or whatever. Um, and, and that may be true. I mean, I've seen some beautiful things that people make with traditional woodworking. I wish I had those skills, um, but I don't. And furthermore, I don't have the time. Like I, I'm not a woodworker by trade. I don't, um, and I don't even enjoy like making woodworking projects, like a rocking chair or something for my house. Like I know people that do that. However, I do have the skill of knowing how to run and optimize a CNC machine. So I can still make the things I need. I just do it in less time and I don't have to worry about having, you know, $20,000 worth of extra uh, equipment in my shop and, and know how to properly set them up and use them. Right. So those are my side panels. Um, the other thing, so I have another layer here and it's the same, so I, I don't have to go through them as, as much, but I have my door panel top and bottom, which is right here. So this is basically the same thing, except I don't need to use the chamfer toolpath because this is just a profile. Right? I'm only I'm only cutting a profile. So on this one, this is the top and bottom. So I have two uh, toolpaths set. I have the uh, glass pocket uh, rabbit, and then I have the top and bottom door panel. So just to show you what that looks like, if I hit reset preview, preview visible, you know this is what I'm going to end up there. So here's my recess for the glass, and then I've got my 45. So I would lay, you know, the long side pieces on either side, and then I'd make a top and a bottom. I'd probably use some corner clamps or a strap clamp, put glue in the corners, and let it sit for an hour, and I'm going to have a perfectly flat uh, with perfect 45-degree miters. And all you did there was draw a single vector line at, at a 45-degree angle. That's it. Yeah, just a... Uh, I, I basically drew this out. I knew that my length on this was going to be 14 and a half inches by two. So I drew a rectangle, 14 and a half by two. And then I went and I grabbed the line tool and I went to this corner and I dragged down till it said 45 degrees and I snapped it. And then I used the scissor tool and I cut away everything I didn't need. And this is what I was left with. So that's my, that's my top and bottom pieces. And then I have another layer for my sides which are just same thing, just longer. What would um, be the downside of using the geometry of a 45 degree V bit to cut a miter? Okay. So you wouldn't have used for this. You can't use, there's no reason to use a 45 degree V bit for this because right. But on the panel, cut, on the previous on the, panel, on the side panels. Yes, you could absolutely that. And I had thought about that. That's certainly another way to do it. Um, the thing to keep in mind is I have to, Kind of draw it because I don't know how else to explain. So I'm gonna draw. I'm gonna draw a rectangle here, and I'm gonna set this up to be um, three quarter inch 
by width doesn't matter. Okay. So there's my board, right? Now you want to go ahead and you want to cut a 45 degree on that. So I'm going to grab the line tool. I'm going to come over. Our uh, computer has some lagging issues here. Um, I'm going to draw this out until I'm at 45. All right. And now I can, um, I can just use the scissor tool and cut that away. So now I have my three quarter inch board and I have the angle right here that I want to cut. Now by clicking on that, um, what we need to do now is determine how long that, that is right. So to go from here to here using the inspection tool, I'm at 1.06 is my distance. So that would mean that I would have to have a V bit, a 90 degree V bit that has a cut edge on one side of at least 1.06 inches. So if you're running a smaller desktop machine, you're going to be limited to quarter inch shank tooling. You're not going to be able to find yourself a, a V bit that side, has yeah. a one inch side on it. You're, you're not because now that V bit is so big and heavy, right? You've got to get up to half inch or even three quarter inch shank in order to be able to support something like that. So yes, you could, if you're using a bigger machine, something that's more industrial, you could certainly, um, you could certainly do that, uh, and use a, a V bit to cut that. And then you would, you would do the same thing. You would use the same vector that I drew that single vector on the top. And yep. you would just say, I'm going to use a V bit. I'm going to cut on the line on that vector. And you'll probably have to do it in a couple of passes. I don't know. I mean, unless you got a pretty rigid machine, I don't know that I'd plow a V-bit through in one shot, but maybe two passes. And then you're going to end up also with a perfect 45. And it'll be quicker, no doubt, because now you're not you're not carving down with a ball nose. It's much quicker to do this if your if machine, you have enough length. if you can get that cut length to be able to do that. So you would need you know 1.06, so 1.1 inches, let's just say, would be, have to be your side cut length on that. I know Amana Tools has some. And I'm sure there's other vendors out there that do have that. Um, you could also do it with a chamfer gadget too and do a step down. I've never done it that way because you could treat it um, instead of a ball nose. You could you could use a V bit and do it that way. And it, basically, what it's doing is it's it's following the angle all the way down. Um, I just traditionally use the ball nose, and most people that have a CNC router are going to have a ball nose end mill where you may not want to go out and spend two hundred dollars on a V bit that's this big. Um, you could also get away with using a V bit that's smaller and just doing the step down. So you could do that as well. So you could use a, uh, a V bit that's got a half inch side length. Uh, you wouldn't be able to cut it in one pass. You would have to cut it and then shift down and over and then cut it again. And again, I think that gadget, um, for the chamfer will do that as well. I've just never tested it, so I can't say for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that it'll, it will do that. So that's, that's why, I mean, to answer your question, that that's why, um, yes, you could absolutely do that if you have the, the tools and everything you need to make that happen. Now, um, because we're running out, up on time here, the last two things I did here, oh my gosh, my computer is really not liking me here. Um, last two things I did was I have a, uh, let's see, we'll turn Profile is going to stay on. I have the acrylic panel, so that's right here. Basically, I could take, again, I could take the fixture, right, that I have on the machine. I could take a piece of acrylic. I can lay it right over the top, um, just like that, and I could just make sure the cord stays inside the top and bottom uh, cutoff points of that acrylic. And now when I turn this on, that fixture is going to hold that acrylic down and I can run my tool path around the outside edge. Uh, I did also on the acrylic, I did also draw radius corners because I know that I'm going to have a radius inside corner with my end mill. So that way I don't have to worry about doing any hand filing or anything later. I took that into account now. So when I put that in there, it's, it's going to be a, a perfect fit. Um, so that's my acrylic panel. And then the last thing is the back panel. So the back panel here, uh, same thing. I can use the fixture to hold it down. And 
you know, there's no, no problem there. I apologize for anybody that's watching this video. This computer is really jerky for some reason. I think it's because I'm screen recording as well. It's because you talk bad about PC all the time and it's not a Mac. PC. So it's true. They treat you how you, they, you treat them. If this was a Mac, I wouldn't be having this problem. <laughs> all right. So, um, right here, this is my back panel. So what I have is I, I cut the back panel out. I radius the outside corners again, so it fits nicely. I don't have to worry about that. I have sets of holes here. These holes are where the dowels would go. So I will be putting dowels in. That's what the knives will be sitting on when it's finished. So those are dowel pocket holes. And these vertical lines, they're, the reason I have the vertical lines there is just to make this look like I did a glue up with, with multiple boards, right? Because again, I'm using plywood. So if you look at this, I have um, two vertical lines and my tool path for this, I'm using a, a, ra a center point radius tool from Amana 56126. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to run that on the line going vertical right down the center of each of these lines. And that's going to give me a radius profile on either edge. So it'll look like I, like a beadboard, like I had taken three pieces of wood and glued them together at, with a beadboard on the center. And that's just going to give me a different, um, a different look. And so the I, back plate is going to hold the, all the dowels and actually hold the knives. Correct. Yeah. So I'll simulate that. So I was wondering why you didn't just throw a piece of cardboard back there, like an Ikea piece of furniture, if it was just decorative, but yeah, it's not, that's what's actually going to ah. support the, uh, so here's the, this is the finished piece and you can see I've got those channels that are routed in right here. So it's a radius on either side. And then in the center of that, I have my holes for the dowel pins. So the dowels are going to sit in there. And then this panel will drop right inside the rabbit that I created along the side panels. So mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's basically, um, basically, yeah, I've been talking for an hour about this, but, um, Again, I, it's important that everybody understands what the reasoning, you know, I, I'm sure I can get a ton of comments. People would be like, oh, there's a quicker way to do it, blah, blah, blah. I'm not thinking about making just one. I'm thinking about having to make a hundred. I want this to be repeatable. I want it to be easy. I do not want to have to sit there and put a piece of wood on this fixture and use calipers and be to the thousandth when I line it up. I want to be able to make sure that I can put the wood on here and what'll happen that, that's kind of interesting is if you look at the fixture and I'm going to turn off the back panel. So when I cut the, let's just say the, um, the box, uh, the sideboards here, when I cut that, when my end mill runs all the way around this perimeter to cut this out, I'm cutting into the fixture slightly with that. Cause I'm doing a cleanup. I, I want to go all the way through. So I'm going to cut, five or 10 thousandths deeper than the thickness of my material. What's going to end up happening is at the end, I'm going to have a tool mark from that profile cut, cut into my fixture after I make the first board that acts as my alignment. So when I put another piece of wood on there, all I have to do is make sure that when I put the wood on, I can't see those tool marks. And I know that when my MNO runs around, I'm, I'm fine. You know, my board's on, it's covered. Um, so I don't need to have a guide edge or I don't need to have dowel pins or anything like that to line it. I just need to make sure when I put the board on that it covers the tool marks from the previous one. And the same thing when I do the top and bottom board, right? That one's shorter. So I'm going to have a tool mark going right here, right through the center of the fixture. So I just want to make sure that when I put my board on there, that it at least covers that tool mark. And, and then I know that I'm, I'm lined up and I turn the vacuum on and I cut it. So Nice and easy. It's repeatable. When I do the side pieces, those are the two inch boards. I'm going to have tool marks on the inside as well. So those tool marks are what I'm going to use to ensure that every time we run uh, a set of this jobs, everything just works. And I don't have to sit there like a maniac with alignment and tape measures and all this stuff. I just have to make sure that I cover the tool marks, turn on the vacuum, run the program. So that's it. But uh, any other questions on why I went through this huge process. Wow. We're in trouble, Bobby. Yeah. I, I, you know, there's one other thing I probably will do with this that, um, I didn't think about yet, but I want to put a radius edge. I already said that around the per perimeter of the door. Right. 
And because when I cut these door pieces off, I'm cutting from the back side because I got to put this rabbit in for the, uh, for the glass. I don't, I'm not looking at the top surface, so I don't have the ability to, um, to round over this edge with the machine. And I refuse to do it with a hand tool. So what I will most likely end up doing is make, I'll probably put four dowel pins in this fixture to represent the corners. So when this thing is glued up, I can drop this panel here um, over those dowel pins for alignment. And then I can run a, um, I can run a round over bit around the outside edge of it, maybe. The only issue I'm gonna have is I still have to hold it down. So I have to somehow get some vacuum, even if it's just on the top and bottom, I have to get some vacuum in there. So I may run a T out this way um, and, and, and on the top so I can grab it with vacuum here, you know, in four points, like uh, 12, six, three, and nine. And that'll hold it down. But I'm not, I haven't figured that part out yet. I'll do that once I uh, actually cut the pieces and glue it up. Then I'll determine how I wanna round over those edges. But my goal here is to use the machine 100% with the exception of a screw gun or a screwdriver to put the hinges in. So this is where I'm at. What, what would be scary to me here is that you, you're doing all this upfront investment, which is going to save you eons when you're actually cutting them. I mean, you're going to produce more than we ever could if we don't have these fixtures. But what if, what if the initial one doesn't sell? What if, that, what if you have trouble getting off the ground? This is a lot of upfront investment, and that, that's what would scare me a little bit. Okay, so the same thing holds true. If you're in a business and you want to start, um, I don't know, a sandwich shop, and you're going to spend how much money in a grill and refrigeration and tables and signage and advertising, and you're going to do all of that. Without your first sale. Without your first sale. And what happens if you go ahead and you start and you do all of that, and, and you, you only get two people a day to come in to buy a sandwich, right? So the same thing holds true with any business. Show me a business that you don't have to invest some money and on some and have some risk that you're not going to get sales. Yeah, and there's not a lot of money here. I mean, don't get me wrong. No, it's this, just this, time. Yeah, it's I'm time. Just putting it's time. time in. So I mean, I I could have done this, like I said, with double side tape. I could make a prototype, and then what if it did sell? Now I got to come back and do this anyway. So for me, and just the way I program things, this was easier for me than going out there and trying to monkey around with double side tape. Cause if I use double side tape, I got to make sure I, I align everything. Each piece that you put down is not going to have the same X, Y, zero, right? You're going to, you know, it's it, the, the piece could move. You could have it not straight on the machine. There's a lot of variables when you're using double side tape. The only way that this would work if I did double side tape is if I bought like a 12 inch wide board tape that down and then cut all of the pieces out of that one board at right, one time. Exactly. Um, that would be the only way that, that it would work. Otherwise it'd be a pain in the neck. So this way seemed to work out, you know, I, uh, in theory and well, I know, I know it's going to work cause I do vacuum fixtures all the time. So it's going to work perfectly, but it's, you know, maybe I'll optimize it. So maybe, you know, after I cut one, I'll be like, Oh, I should have done this different. It's going to hold down better or whatever. But the only thing I haven't figured out is putting the radius on the outside of the door, and that'll have to be uh, that'll have to be later. But yeah, so this is how I think when I design something. Definitely, um, I wouldn't say it's super advanced, but it's not beginner. Um, but if everybody started thinking and you had a vacuum table for your machine, uh, and you start thinking about using that vacuum for everything going forward it will quickly uh, move you past intermediate into the advanced machining because you can hold anything down uh, any way you want when you're using vacuum. It's just a matter of, of quarantining the, um, the vacuum channels to your part. So, but anyway, so that was me talking for a while. Sorry about that for everybody that hates hearing my voice. Um, but this was the point. So this will be a YouTube video as well. And uh, next week, We'll do either Greg or Bobby's. Um, they're going to sit here and they're going to record their screen and use uh, show, explain to you how they're doing their project. And then the week after will be whoever hasn't gone yet. And then by that time, we should be into cutting and, and we'll have videos put up of, of all the projects getting made, including any mess-ups we do, because that's important too. Yeah, that's very important. So that being said, I... Um, I think we're at a little over an hour, hour and 10 minutes. So 
I apologize this went longer than, than normal, but uh, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks for being a part of this journey with the Think It, Make It Challenge. And uh, we uh, look forward to any comments or questions you have. And we hope you have a great week, and we will be back here next week. Next week, we won't forget the tech tip either. <laughs> Correct. We won't forget that because we'll have time for that. So we'll see you next week. All right. Thank you for listening to the Think It, Make It podcast. Be sure to tune in next time for more great CNC router content.